the book of Galatians defends the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is a gospel of grace. And after the Apostle Paul has looked at all the troubles that the church in Galatia faces with terms of religious performance, he comes to one conclusion, that there is only one thing in religion that he can boast about. And it's nothing that we might expect. It's not the training that he received under Gamaliel. It's not his Jewish heritage being a Benjamite circumcised on the eighth day. It's not in the observance of the law, as it were, blameless. But Apostle Paul, in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 14, decides, inspired by the Holy Spirit, moved along, as it were, by the Spirit of God, that for Christians there is only one thing that we are opposed, supposed to boast about. And I read Galatians, Galatians 6, verse 14, from the New Living Translation, reads, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest has, in me has also died. My message today is called the Wondrous Cross of Christ. My message today is called the Wondrous Cross of Christ. Why is it that such a religious person as Paul would conclude that there is only one thing praiseworthy in all of religion, that is to say, the cross of Christ. Why is the cross of Christ unique? Why is the cross of Christ praiseworthy? Why is the cross of Christ the central message of Christianity? Why is the gospel message centered around the cross of Christ? And why is there no other message given to mankind that is so opposed by those who disagree and those who do not believe it. But today I would like to share with you from the scripture why the message of the cross is such a wondrous message, not only to Apostle Paul, but to all of those who wish to be redeemed, to all of those who wish to be pardoned, to all of those who wish to have eternal life, to all of us who would wish to enjoy eternity in heaven. Let us turn to the, the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And there we will see that through the cross of Christ, a work was done that could not have been accomplished by keeping of the law or by religious observance. That is to say, keeping your dues and avoiding your don'ts, checking off, your religious duties, as it were, would not open the gates of heaven, would not give redemption, and would not become something praiseworthy. Because God is a God of grace, and his means of pardoning sinners was through grace. Let us look at Romans 8, verses 1 to 3. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? God has declared no longer guilty those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God did not declare the rule keepers righteous, nor did God declare religious people righteous. No, rather God declared those righteous who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And verse 2 says, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. This is why the cross is so wondrous. This is why the cross is so marvelous. It has the power to free us, humankind, from sin which leads to death. Some might say, perhaps you have sin to account for, but I'm blameless. But a closer examination of this Bible, even the Ten Commandments, would show indeed that we are all sinners and all fall short 
of the glory of God. But now look at what God has done. God has declared us no longer guilty on the basis of the cross of Christ and faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What could not be done through the works of the flesh, through keeping of the law, because the flesh was weak, was done by the Spirit of God, working mightily through Christ to bring about perfect obedience to the Father. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ, although tempted in all ways as we were, yet without sin. So Jesus Christ did for us what we were incapable of doing. Verse 3 says in Romans 8 that the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And so you see, brothers and sisters, the work of God was perfected on the cross of Jesus Christ, where God's holy son, his blameless son, was offered up as an atonement, as a sacrifice, as a substitute, as a payment for your redemption, for your salvation, for your pardon, for the forgiveness of your sins, so that your guilt could be removed, so that your name could be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, so that you could be an adopted son or daughter of the Most High God, so that you could have eternal life living in you, by the person of the Holy Spirit who comes to inhabit you when you believe in the person of Jesus Christ. Let us go back to our text in Galatians chapter 6 and we read what Paul says in verse 15. Paul says in verse 15, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. So you see, friends, the work of God to bring about salvation is not an outward work. It's not joining a church. It's not being baptized as an infant or an adult. It's not wearing a religious garment on Sunday. It's not being part of of the, the men's choir Thank or you. part of the women's fellowship or being part of this church or this organization or doing these good deeds or that good deeds. But rather, the peace that comes from God is a transformed life, a life that is given to us by the Spirit because we become new creatures. The cross of Christ is wondrous because Jesus Christ died for sinners. The cross of Christ is wondrous because Jesus Christ died for sinners. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 
Have you appropriated Christ as your own personal Savior? The Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. There is a kind of faith that is saving faith. Faith in the Savior. Faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in His blood atonement. Faith in His substitutionary death on the cross. For that is why Christ Jesus came. Friends, I tell you again that the cross of Christ is wondrous because not only did Christ bear our sins on the cross, but Christ bore our guilt as well. Let us go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 to 25. He, Jesus Christ, personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds we, you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Jesus is calling. He's calling for the lost. He's calling for the separated. He's calling for the estranged. The Bible says that anyone who wishes to come to God will come to God so that it can be seen that the deeds they do are wrought in God. 1 John 3, 18 or 19. God is calling us to himself that we might be his adopted children so that we can do the deeds of our Father in heaven. The Bible says that if we don't come to the light, it's because our deeds are evil and we don't want our deeds to be exposed. But friends, don't allow evil deeds to separate you from your God. Jesus hung on the cross to take away your guilt from those deeds. The Bible says that to the God of heaven, even darkness is as light, and, and even the light is still light to him. That is to say, we cannot hide anything from God. Whether we disclose our sin to him today and say, God, forgive me, I am a sinner, he will forgive you. But if we hold, harbor our sin, our sin will still be judged. God is still the judge of all mankind. The Bible says, as, as every, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow. That is to say, we must one day bow the knee to God, whether it be now, as someone who's repentant, someone who's willing to turn, or whether it be in the future. And may the Lord forbid it that any of us should have to face the great white throne where it will be too late to repent, where it will be too late to confess Christ as our Savior, because that, there we will meet him as our judge. Take him now as your lamb, rather than as your judge. I tell you, I tell you that the world was crucified to me, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let us go there for a moment. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. For the believer... The life that we now live is Christ in us, our hope of glory. The life we live, we live by faith, trusting that the Son of God is able to keep us, is able to keep us within the Beloved. What of the one who's not yet trusted in Christ as their all in all? Are they still living for the vain things of the world? Have we not heard enough sermons to tell us that the things of this world are passing away and the lust thereof. Oh sure, you can have temporary success in this world. Perhaps you'll have temporary fame or temporary power or temporary popularity or temporary pleasure. But if you're honest with yourself, wouldn't you agree that all of those things are temporary? 
What will bring you lasting satisfaction? What will bring you lasting salvation for your soul? The Bible says, naked we came into this world, and naked we shall depart. The only thing that we will bring with us after this life is the soul and spirit that God has breathed in these bodies. And this body will stay in a, in a casket and will be buried in the ground, or perhaps cremated. But know that the soul and the spirit will live forever, and God will cause a resurrection of both good and evil. Those who have done right in his sight by obeying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and living in the power of the Holy Spirit will rise again to new life in glory and jubilation and joy everlasting. But those who have rejected Christ and his cross will rise to a resurrection of shame and contempt. Let us not fall into this horrible pit. The Bible says that grace was what God has done for us and for you and me. The cross of Christ is wondrous because it is God's provision of grace for you and I. The cross of Christ is wondrous because it is God's provision of grace for you and I. Romans 1 verse 18 says that the wrath of God was shown against all ungodliness. This is what brought Christ Jesus to the cross, ungodliness, breaking of the law. But the same apostle who tells us of the wrath of God also tells us of the mercy of God in Romans chapter 116. He tells us that the gospel is God's power of salvation to anyone who believes. God is offering you a second chance. God is offering you a pardon. God is offering you forgiveness of sin. And friend, it is found in the provision of the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, he was not hanging there for a crime he had committed. The human courts accused him of blasphemy, yet Christ had never blasphemed. The human courts have accused Christ of calling himself the king of the Jews. Christ was the king of the Jews, but they had, he had never made that bold profession. It was factual because of his deeds. Jesus says, if you, not, if you do not believe I am who I am, believe the miracles that testify about me, that Christ was indeed the King of the Jews, but not just the King of the Jews, but the Savior of the whole world. Christ Jesus was God's sacrificial lamb. The God of the Bible is holy. God is holy. The God of the Bible is just. That's why we read in the book of the law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the God of the Bible is a loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that anyone who believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I urge you, brothers and sisters, believe on the son. Kiss the son now. Be reconciled to your God. This grace was poured out for you and me. The cross of Christ is wondrous because the Savior of the world made a payment on the cross for you and for me. The cross of Christ is wondrous because the Savior of the world made a payment for you and for me. Let us go to 1 John verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, not only for our sins, but of the whole world, or of the world. And friends, let me clarify with you that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the universal savior, whether you're from African descent, whether you're from Asian descent, whether you're from South America, or Europe, or, or North America, or offer any descent that you are from. He is the universal Savior. But let it, be, let it be known that Christ would die only for those who would believe. In 1 John 2, 2, I read, writing, He himself is the sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but that of the whole world. 
and we, we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. So even though Christ's offer is for all people, how many have received our message? How many have believed our testimony? Ours is the lot to obey the message of God. And the message of God in this age, in this dispensation, is that we believe on his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God was in fact reconciling the world through himself, through the shed blood of his Son, Jesus Christ. And what ought to be our response to this message of grace, this offer of salvation, the wondrous cross of Jesus Christ? Let us look at Romans 10, verse 9. And I will close. After hearing the good news that God has died upon the cross for your sins in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, after hearing that God is offering you redemption or forgiveness of sin, God is willing to pardon your sins based on the death of Christ upon the cross. What ought to be your response? What ought to be my response in this in turn? Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. So now, in closing, I will lead us in a prayer of faith that if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you wish to be saved of your sin, you can pray this prayer to your Father in heaven. Dear Father in heaven, I acknowledge that I have sinned by thought, word, and deed. And you can name the specific sin that you know you've done against God. But Father, I desire to receive your grace. I desire to receive your pardon. I believe that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for my personal sins. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he rose back from the dead on the third day. I confess, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. I turn from my sin and I put my faith in Jesus that he would wash me clean of my sins, that he would baptize me with his Holy Spirit and that I would begin to live a life that is pleasing to God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I pray this prayer by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world and my personal Savior. Amen.